best SummerSlam ever, ever, ever. Oopsie, the worst rapper alive. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Big Max back on the mic like oops. Back on the horse, still jumping through hoops. I'm missing Lincoln Pink, I don't lip sync. Just to be clear, choking isn't my kink, but I do it anyway sometimes, I guess. Gotta laugh now, die later in my times of stress. I'm blessed, feeling good, charged up like a Hadouken. Welcome into the Worst Wrestling Podcast. I am your host with the least, Jack Lusnay. I am joined by my co-host, Rocky the Doggy. But no, for reals, we are reviewing SummerSlam, possibly the greatest SummerSlam that has ever happened. Uh, it's funny because I, I did a review of SummerSlam 26, and I thought there was an argument to be made that that was the best SummerSlam. I saw uh, online people were saying uh, SummerSlam 2002 has finally been surpassed. I would argue, yes, this is the best SummerSlam that we have ever had. And it all started with the ultimate betrayal. Liv Morgan takes it all from Mommy, Rhea Ripley. So, you know, it's funny because I thought this match had potential to be the main event. Uh, but they actually went with it right to start. And that actually had me afraid that they were not going to commit to the the heel turn, if you want to call it that, because Dominic Mysterio very clearly already a heel. So uh, it all starts with the match. The match itself was uh, pretty great. I mean, I think there were people that really were into the shoulder gimmick. I thought it was a little bit over the edge maybe for me. You know, like you're out, uh, Rhea Ripley's out here trying to pop her shoulder back in the place like she's fucking blade uh you know uh who just grabbed onto the fucking train you know what i'm saying uh shout out if you know that reference so you know it was a it was a little bit overused but it was a solid ass match uh it all came down to the ending though where you know rhea ripley's ultimately going to use the chair and cost herself the title and so dom stops her from doing that and that's the moment where, especially in my head, and even out loud, I said, oh, no, they're going to do, like, the lame accidental, like, oh, I accidentally cost her the title, but I'm still on mommy's. And I thought they were going to belabor this shit with the ju- No. No. So, two things happened. And I don't know if it was intentional, but this... So, obviously, he takes the chair from mommy, and then uh, he... There's a moment where... Rhea almost wins, and then Dom slides the chair back in the ring in between her and uh, Liv. Or no, sorry. So that's what it is. Liv hits the oblivion on Rhea, and uh, Rhea kicks out. And then Dom slides the chair in between them, and he goes to distract the referee, and actually it ends up being Liv who hits another oblivion, this time on the chair, um, and then for the win. And we get this uh, camera angle of Dom smiling. And so I wonder if that was purposeful or if that was actually like by accident. Because uh, there's a little bit of a tell and a giveaway that like, and I thought that's what they were. it was going to be. I thought it was just going to be that smile and that he was going to then go back to mommy. And I thought that would be the thing of like, oh, was Dom actually happy? You know, da, da. no, he helps live up and then plants a big old wet one and we get the full turn and betrayal and it was oh it was fucking juicy and it just set the stage for the whole evening and it just was fucking banger after banger after banger Braun Breaker versus Sami Zayn so this was you know not the greatest match it's like six minutes long but hey the right man won Braun Breaker is your new intercontinental champion. And, you know, I have the hindsight now of I've already watched the Monday Night Raw after SummerSlam, which also was fucking cooking, by the way. Um, 
And now I know that uh, next week they're going to have the two out of three falls, Sami Zayn versus Braun Breaker. Uh, so that's going to be great. Uh, but yeah, we don't have to belabor the point. Braun Breaker went over with a super, he hit Sammy with a spear and then hit him with a super spear. Cool. Next match Logan Paul versus L.A. Knight. Yeah. So again, just my brain as a wrestling fan, I'm coming off of Sammy versus Braun Breaker and I'm thinking title change. No way they're doing the title change again back-to-back. Back. Uh-uh. No. They hit us back-to-back back with the title changes. And I was like, hot damn. Holy shit, this is a fucking show. So, Logan Paul versus LA Knight. First of all, it was a really good match overall. Um, you know, I think they have some good chemistry between Logan Paul and LA Knight. I don't know if it's like a real hatred, but it comes off that way. Um but then it ultimately ends with a count. Uh, so there's like the fuckery with the uh, with the brass nuts, and uh, he gets uh, Logan Paul gets the nuts from one of his friends on the outside, or from MGK, who had it around his uh, neck, and uh, he ends up trying to go for like a buckshot lariat, but it gets countered into a, a BFT, and that's how the championship changes. And so we get back to back title changes. And then I I was like, there's no way we're going back to back to back. But that's exactly what the fuck would happen. Bailey versus Nia Jax. I thought this was gonna be one where Bailey retained and really kind of cemented her title reign. But uh-uh, Nia Jax. And I Look, all credit where credit is due. I've never been a huge Nia Jax fan. Um, I wasn't one of the people who was like, oh, she's dangerous. I never really was, like, belaboring that point. But I just wasn't a fan. I just kind of thought she was kind of basic, to be perfectly honest. Her character has always been kind of one note in this uh, tone of, like, I'm better than you um, because I'm bigger than you. and. You know, she hasn't always had to face, like, obstacles or challenges because of that. And that can be disinteresting at times. But I think what she's done since winning Queen of the Ring, and this match in particular, I thought Nia Jax was tremendous. So just absolute kudos to her. Uh, but we get... This was honestly... Up until this point, too, this was the best match uh, that had happened on the card. Uh, like Liv versus Rhea was decent. Logan Paul versus LA Knight was pretty good, but I thought Nia and Bailey stole the show a little bit until the next all sets of matches. Um, but this match was I thought amazing. Bailey kicking out of an annihilator, and at one point hitting a power bomb on Nia Jax for a close fall, and then you got uh, Tiffy Time doing the fake cash in where she was actually aligned with Nia Jax and it was just a distraction. And then Nia would just smoke Bailey with a double annihilator to become the new WWE SmackDown women's champion. So we had again, three title changes in a row back to back to back. Triple H was in there cooking like Gordon Ramsay. My God. And then, we got CM Punk versus Drew McIntyre with Seth Rollins as the special guest special guest referee. And this was just like, man, this this was cinema. This was as cathartic a match and ending as you could ask for. To the point that I'm almost like in the back of my mind, I knew that this was going to continue on Monday Night Raw, and it obviously did. Um, but before we get to that, I just the the match itself was incredible. The aura for CM Punk's first match, basically since returning to WWE, because obviously he got hurt at the Royal Rumble, so this is his first real singles match since returning to WWE. The pop was incredible. The aura was incredible. I thought. The way that they paid homage to uh, the Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels feud of 1997 
at, with the uh, with the special guest referee matching it with Taker, like all the little things. Um, and then ultimately Punk's obsession with the bracelet and, uh, you know, uh, fucking with Seth Rollins. And that would ultimately cost him the match, which, you know, his own hubris and the thing that he had always accused Drew McIntyre of, that's what would really cost him here against Drew McIntyre, who in his own right, you know, finally gets a cathartic victory after all the bullshit of like, you know, the failed, um, you know, the money in the bank being cash on him after WrestleMania and then his own failed money in the bank cash in, um, you know, this was, I thought a cathartic ending and I thought they would maybe move on for a little bit, but obviously the bit with at the end of the match, Drew McIntyre takes the bracelet back from CM Punk. And I really thought, I didn't think he was going to take it back and keep it. I thought he would either break it or he would look at it and be like, I don't need this anymore and put it back on punk kind of rethinking it and maybe cool the feud or end the feud. But obviously they want to keep it going. It is a hot ass feud, so I don't blame them at all. Uh, but you know, with CM Punk coming out on Monday night, Raw to cut a promo and then being interrupted by Seth Rollins, which I thought was hilarious because as soon as Seth came out, Punk reacted so perfectly where he was like, son of a bitch. Um, and I thought that was great. And then Drew McIntyre coming out and being like, yeah, talking about uh, Punk's bracelet again. He's like, your ugly dog and your lovely wife. And then, of course, CM Punk goes chasing after him. Uh, and then Seth Rollins gets fucking destroyed by Bronson Reed. Just eats like six tsunamis and is spitting up blood. So obviously Seth being taken out of this feud so that Punk and McIntyre can have a proper match and finish. And I'm assuming that, uh, you know, Punk Rollins might get pushed to WrestleMania. I could see that being a WrestleMania match. Uh, but yeah, so after all that, <laughs> which is funny because I remember like uh, there was a moment in my mind where all of that happens and it's kind of, you know, uh, Drew McIntyre takes a bracelet and leaves and like all of this emotion as well. And then for a moment I was like, oh, so that's the end of the show. That's, that's SummerSlam. It's over. I was like, wait, no, there's still fucking two more matches. And that was for the World Heavyweight Championship. And this match, in my opinion, absolutely stole the show. To me, this was by far my favorite match on the entire card. First of all, I am huge Gunther Stan. Uh, Gunther is my absolute favorite uh, wrestler in WWE right now. Every single match this man has is fucking five-star worthy. I thought this match in particular, Damian Priest, I thought presented an excellent um i guess a, a foe uh rival an obstacle we talked about earlier how there are some wrestlers who you know like there uh, Nia Jax for example it's like i'm so much bigger than everybody else that there are no real obstacles for me gunther as good as he is there are times where he'll run into an opponent where you can tell, like, oh, shit, this is, like, getting real. This is an obstacle. This is a challenge for Gunther. Um, and it's they're kind of few and far between, if you really think about it. Like, And I'm talking about physical, imposing presence. I'm not talking about, like, the ricochets of the world, the Xavier Woods of the world, where they are tremendous athletes and skilled, and you do believe that they can win. I'm talking about, like, when he's against Sheamus and they're just beating the fuck out of each other. I'm talking about when he's against Drew McIntyre. Yo, go back and watch the triple threat match between Sheamus, Drew McIntyre, and Gunther. When Drew McIntyre hits Gunther, you can see Gunther reacts just a little bit different than when he's getting hit by even Sheamus. 
Like Drew McIntyre can lay it into a motherfucker. So like, you know, some of these, when I see like the, again, Gunther versus Drew McIntyre is one where I, I feel like he's truly getting tested and Damian Priest to his credit with the martial arts background, with his size, with his skill set in the ring, absolutely a believable uh, asset for this, for the WWE. I think he is much better in the ring even than he is on the mic. And I, I, I think he's okay on the mic. This isn't me shitting on him saying like, oh, he's terrible. He does, I feel like, kind of flub a lot of lines and sometimes he says some nerdy shit and I don't know where that comes from of uh, if it's like him coming, trying to come up with it on the cusp or if that's being fed to him. Like, there was a moment where this motherfucker in the back uh, with the Terror Twins, so this was post on Raw, and we'll I can talk about the segment in a sec, but just kind of jumping ahead. After uh, being saved essentially by Rhea Ripley and being in the back, like him and Rhea Ripley are talking about the new Judgment Day, and he's like, he's like, the rain! Or he's like, the pain will rain. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. The pain will rain mostly on the plains in Spain. Like, what the fuck, bro? Come on. <laughs> Anyways, um, on Raw, just kind of recapping. So, fuck. I didn't even on Raw. Sorry, on SummerSlam. So, meat on meat. Just beating the hell out of each other. Fantastic match. We get to, there's a moment where Finn Balor comes out and he does it in a sense where he's rooting for Damian Priest. And he's really rooting him on. And uh, Gunther like hits Finn Balor and it fires Priest up to the point that like Priest hits. Uh, I can't remember if it was he hit the choke slam or whatever. I think it was like maybe the he hits a big move. I, I think it was Razor's Edge actually that he hits. Um, and then he kind of pushes Gunther over to go for the pin. And wouldn't you know it, that bastard, that that evil villain Prince Devitt, aka Finn Balor, he'd been planning it all along. The betrayal times two and the implosion of the judgment day officialized uh he would grab gunther's leg and he would put it on the bottom rope uh and then so you can see damian priest watches it back on the titan tron and then he goes to attack finn balor once he realizes what has happened and that allows gunther to take advantage there's even a moment though where like damian priest is able to counter and start fighting back and immediately goes after Finn Balor. And that ultimately is what costs him the match. And Gunther is your new world heavyweight champion. He's going to hold that ship for a long time. But yeah, so on Raw, to start off, we would get Gunther with the championship. Um, and he, I think... What's great is you can separate Damian Priest for a while, obviously, because he has to deal with the Judgment Day problem. But he said himself, I can win back the championship. That's no problem. And I think you've definitely got a solid rematch set up for Damian Priest versus Gunther because that match was way better than I was expecting. But ultimately, on Raw, you would have Gunther come out, do his promo. I'm the new world heavyweight champion. I'm the best. You know, nobody compares to me. And then Randy Orton comes out. Um, and I thought it was perfect how he referenced the fact that his shoulder was up at King of the Ring. Even Gunther admitted, yeah, that's a blemish on my record. And so we're going to get uh, Gunther versus Randy Orton at Bash of Berlin. So that'll be one hell of a match. But then later in the evening, like I said, Damian Priest comes out massive pop he's fully over now like he this is a, a face turn for damian priest and rhea ripley and it was done to 
I mean, he was already starting to get the cheers anyways, but this is just like to great effect. He's getting a huge pop and huge responses from the crowd. Um, and he's just tremendous. Like I said, he's a tremendous imposing figure is the bisexual undertaker. And I really love, again, his in-ring style and the way he really lays his shit in. He is fucking good, man. So I'm excited to see the feud continue. Obviously, we're going to get, at some point, Damian Priest versus Finn Balor. Uh, we'll get entanglements with the Terror Twins, a.k.a. Damian Priest and Rhea Ripley, and the new Judgment Day. So this is just like the... It's funny that like the Judgment Day has become essentially the best storyline in WWE, even above the Bloodline, because I think a lot of the Bloodline stuff, you know, before Roman Reigns, which we'll talk about in the next segment, um, I feel like it gone stale, and it's like the the juice and the gossip and the the way that they're telling this story with Liv Morgan's. Uh, involvement especially, but obviously the betrayal also of Finn Balor, and now you have this formation of the New Judgment Day. I think it is just... this is You want to talk about cinema, baby. That's what we got here. But, let's not bury the lead. Talked about it a little bit. Let's just get right into the main event. Cody Rhodes versus Solo, Soclo Solo Sokoa in Bloodline Rules. And this was easily the worst match of the night in terms of, like, just the match itself. I think for two reasons. It's one that, I mean, bloodline rules, like, y'all should have been using more weapons from the beginning, I feel like. Like, uh, I would have wanted to see a little bit more of, like, a street fight aspect to this. It felt like just a really basic wrestling match for the first part. And then you get like the obligatory run-ins and none of them were really surprises. Like Kevin Owens and Randy Orton coming back. I think I would have picked literally any other two people to cut. Like, you know, who would have made way more sense. Actually, it would have been a bigger surprise. And I think people would have really loved it. Fucking Jay Uso and Sami Zayn. They were right there. Plum for the picking. They have a relationship with Cody. Um, it, it makes sense that they would want to fight this new version of the bloodline, this per permeated and perverted version of the bloodline. Uh, but ultimately, you had Kevin Owens and Randy Orton, which was all just a setup for uh, Jacob Fatu to come out, do his thing, and then hopefully it's not a real injury. I've seen – this is where kayfabe exists now, where it's like, we can't get real reports from real reporters for WWE because everything is kayfabe in a sense. So it's like there's a nuance of whether or not he actually was hurt or was just really selling. Uh, but it seemed like he hurt his leg. Did Jacob Fatu after coming off the top rope and hitting Cody through the announce table. Uh, but ultimately it was a setup so that uh, Cody and solo would be both laid out in the middle of the ring. And then, Roman Reigns, the original tribal chief, would come back in a full face mode that would give Vince McMahon a fucking raging, uh, a rager. Because, like, Vince tried so hard to get this man over as a face for so long and never came close to this reaction. And all Roman Reigns had to do was carry the title as a heel for four years, and then go away for six months. Because absence does doth make the heart grow fonder. But yeah, Roman Reigns would return, and he would Superman punch and spear Solo Sokoa. He would uh, acknowledge Cody Rhodes with a look, and then he would leave uh, Cody Rhodes to retain the WWE Universal title. And that is how we would end SummerSlam. So the only other thing uh, that I want to talk about before we sign off here uh, is, you know, on Raw, I did want to talk about the Wyatt family debut. Uh, just because, you know, 11 years to the day in Baltimore, where you had the Wyatt family originally debut, you have the Wyatt Six uh 
debut in their first match. And I loved, I love everything about it. I love the presentation. I love that in the match that they're able to just be actual wrestlers. Um, I thought the the new move sets, you know, some of the tag team stuff, power bombing Loomis on the people. I thought all that was great. I thought the ending was appropriate. And I thought in a cathartic way, all the attachments to Bray Wyatt, again, I can understand how some people view that as, you know, embellishment and taking advantage. I don't view it that way at all. When I see, you know, images specifically of Bo Dallas and Eric Rowan embracing and enjoying that moment together, you know, in a cathartic way after the show, this is cameras are off shows over and they're just standing in the ring, holding each other, appreciating the moment that they have where they're able to honor, you know, not just Bray Wyatt, but, um, you know, Luke Harper as well. I just, I think it, this is a storyline that just means more than just professional wrestling. It is still real to me, damn it. But like, no, for real. Like this is one of those ones where it's like part of what makes it so good. And, you know, again, and, if you want to watch just fucking wall to wall professional wrestling matches uh, and you're bitching about the amount of time that was spent actually doing holds in the ring, fuck off and go watch some AEW. All right. That, or fucking some other company. I don't give a shit. I like cinema. I, that's what I'm here for. That's what WWE does so well. Um, so I think, the presentation of the Wyatt Six, and I think the love that the the people within the group have for the legacy and memory of the Wyatt family is so important. And I love that they're getting the chance to do what they're getting to do now. Um, so yeah, I'm just I'm here for the ride, uh, but. We're going to end that ride for this show right here, baby, because I will be in Canton, Ohio for the Fantasy Football Expo 2024. So uh, I'm throwing this one up as a bonus. I'll have another episode that will go up on the old regular time of Saturday at 420. But if you guys really want to help me out, super kick that subscribe button, uh, smash uh, the comments, all the algorithmic BS. But until the next time, I will catch all of you guys on the flip side. My positive contact results in affirmative impact. Never pulled a rise on raps. I'm never primitive, but then I'm ballistic, vicious. Kept with the wristics. I read the terror potency. Epicetic genes, yo. And with the HMCs, that are short and never speak. Some of the is like some of the razor blades and grease in your bare feet. I see your fucking colleagues misprize you very much to your dismay. So today, I can say you won't be running away. Hold your tail between your legs. I'm gonna advocate when you fail with low stakes. I'll take a hacksaw to you cockeyed mumble rap slack jaws. Leave be shredded on a side like some coleslaw. The double time with the clothesline from hell like Bradshaw. I'm toxic like septic shot. A dying breed like cataract.